The AWARE Project's aim is to balance the public conversation about psychedelics, spread accurate information, and give a new face to psychedelia. We feel that this change will occur through connection and relationship, one individual at a time. We are calling on everyone whose lives have been improved through the mindful use of psychedelics to educate themselves and become ambassadors for the psychedelic experience. Show those around you that people who use psychedelics mindfully cross all social, racial, economic, and political boundaries. ...with life-threatening illness and will be a co-therapist at the Phase 3 site in Los Angeles researching MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for severe PTSD. I now welcome Shannon Claire Harlan. How's my volume? Great. Um, I'm grateful to be here. I've lived in San Diego for a couple of years, just about five blocks from here, um, after moving from Santa Cruz, where the MAPS office is based. And it's been wonderful to see the psychedelic community here coming out of the closet, as it very much has in the Bay Area. Um, I was going to have us, actually, I think I want to do this. Um, are you guys up for doing a little activity with me for a couple minutes? Okay. It'll help yeah. us all get to the room, including me. So I encourage you, in a moment we're going to stand up, and the whole activity will take maybe three or four minutes. And you're going to get to know me and some of my work, and I'm really honored to be a representative of NGMA clinical research. But there's such rich community in here, and I know that there's going to be time afterwards for mingling, but some people might have to leave. So I encourage you to stand up and to find somebody you don't know, to share your name, and to share one of the reasons why you came tonight. Go for it.
There is so much really rich community in here, so I love that we can take advantage of all these people who are in the room. Um, what were some couple reasons that you heard for why people are here? We'll hear from maybe two, three people. Be a therapist. Pretty straightforward. Anybody else come from some other reason? <laughs> yeah. I saw the Benzo tent at Lightning in a Bottle, and then I did some research about it and found out that it's actually funded by NAP. So yeah, Zendo. So I hope someday we could do a Zendo project harm reduction training here at the Aware Project in San Diego. One more. Yeah. As a successful patient in the area, I think. I think I'm finding a very interesting inner journey. Wonderful. There's a whole story there, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, welcome. So yes, I'm Shannon Claire Carlin. I'm a marriage family therapist intern, and as Kate, uh, Caitlin said, I manage the therapy training program at MAPS Public Benefit Corporation, and PBC. And in case you're confused what that means instead of MAPS, Two years ago, MAP started a wholly owned subsidiary of Public Benefit Corporation, which means that the Public Benefit Corporation, Corporation can charge tuition and in the future can actually sell MDMA to legal providers, um, whereas a 501c3 nonprofit couldn't do that. Um, we're fully funded by MAPS. Um, we don't have any private investors, just in case you're curious. I'm not sure how clear these slides are going to be on this screen, so hopefully you'll be able to read them as we get closer to them. Um, so the making of a legal MDMA therapist through research and training. MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies organization, was created in 1986, so we just celebrated 31 years. It's been a long time coming that we're finally upon the next phase of research. Um, so I'm excited to tell you about it. Who's familiar with this chemical? <laughs> this is MDMA. <laughs> um, MDMA is called a uh, psychedelic. It's not a classic hallucinogen. It does not typically produce visions or auditory hallucinations. Um, I like to call it an intactogen. It subjectively and therapeutically produces feelings of compassion for oneself and others. We're doing fMRI brain scan studies, and we're finding that one of the possible mechanisms of action is that MDMA reduces activity in the amygdala, which is the fear response center of the brain. Very important for post-traumatic stress. Um, you may have heard of MDMA or experienced it um, in a recreational form in combination with other substances, possibly called ecstasy or molly, um, which typically have a whole mixture of chemicals in them, MDMA being one of many, and typically the one that people characterize as the effects of ecstasy. And so today I'm talking about MDMA in the context of a therapeutic approach. So these are two of our therapists, Michael and Annie Mithofer in Charleston, South Carolina. They've been conducting MDMA-assisted psychotherapy trials for the last 17 years. Um, this is one of our study participants, or at least a volunteer, playing one. And so this is what a lot of our therapy rooms look like. And you'll hear a lot about our therapeutic approach. It's described in depth in our treatment manual, which is posted on the MAPS website. MAPS is a very transparent research organization, so all of our training materials, um, all of our documents and manuals are available online for free. All of our published articles are made accessible to the public. So the therapeutic approach involves a pretty intensive period of four to five months of active treatment, where we're seeing a study participant pretty much weekly, and the therapy that they're getting while they're under the influence of MDMA is a non-directed therapy, otherwise client-focused, so the material that's worked on in the therapy session comes from the client. It's not as if the therapist had an agenda or um, specific interventions that needed to happen at specific time points or specific questions about content. Um, 
And we draw on many different modalities, including internal family systems, Hakomi, somatic experiencing. <coughs> Um, a lot of the approach is based in transpersonal psychology and the work of Stan Groff and holotropic breathwork. Mike Lenani worked for 10 years offering holotropic breathwork groups before they started conducting our MDMA trials. Um, so when we talk about training, holotropic breathwork is great training. Um, and from the holotropic breathwork model, we incorporate professional and appropriate use of bodywork is similar to the somatic um, experiencing work and Hakomi. Knowing that trauma is in the body, Vessel van der Kolk is actually hosting one of our study sites upcoming in Boston. So when we're talking about the treatment, we're talking about MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. It's not just a drug, it's not just therapy, it's both. And you might hear me paraphrase MDMA therapy today. So this is some of the history, the first ever approved trial giving MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for therapeutic benefit was in 92. In order to get a, a drug approved through the FDA, there are different phases of clinical research that need to happen. Um, phase zero is typically animal studies. Phase one is human safety studies. Phase two is when you begin to test a particular treatment on a particular condition. So you'll hear a lot about MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress, or PTSD. Um, and then we moved on to phase two, where, um, as I said, we're treating a particular condition, and you'll hear some of our phase two studies today. We did some long-term follow-up studies, and then we'll be moving on to phase three next year, which you'll hear about too. So the progression of the treatment um, that a study participant goes through, they go through an in-depth screening process, so we screen out for contraindications such as hypertension because MDMA elevates um, the heart rate and blood pressure. And when somebody has passed uh, this thorough screening process, they become enrolled as a participant. So I'm a clinician by training, I really like working with people, and I really don't like working on computers and doing paperwork, <laughs> so I was a little surprised to find myself working in research, but it's because I have seen how effective this treatment is, and so I kind of grin and bear all of the um, bureaucratic and paperwork process. Um, but it is necessary to prove to the FDA that we're doing rigorous science in the hopes of getting this treatment approved as a legal prescription medicine. So we enroll our study participant, and they start their three preparatory sessions. These are 90-minute talk therapy sessions. They're to get to know the person, their trauma, their life story, their coping skills, their inner resources, their support network. Um, also developing therapeutic rapport with them, a, a therapeutic relationship. And preparing them for what they might expect during the experimental session. So common effects of MDMA and maybe some stress reduction techniques like diaphragmatic breathing. So some orientation and some psychoeducation. And after the three preparatory sessions, the participant comes in for their experimental session, which is an eight-hour therapy session. And that's kind of shocking to people who haven't heard that before. Um, and I didn't mention that every participant gets two therapists, so they are treated by a therapy pair. And our model up to this point has been a male-female co-therapy pair. Um, we'll talk about qualifications, but to summarize for the moment, they're usually both mental health providers. Our requirement is that one of them should be a licensed person who can provide psychotherapy in whatever jurisdiction they're working. The other person could be from all sorts of backgrounds because we know there are some great providers who might not have those credential letters after their name. So people who have experience working with trauma or somatic experiencing, or different kinds of body work, holotropic breath work. And they work under the supervision of that licensed person. So every participant, when they're having these therapy sessions, they're meeting with two people. So they come in for their experimental session, and they either get MDMA or they get placebo. And so placebo can either be an active placebo, which is a really low dose of MDMA, or it could be a sugar pill. And 
Nobody except one person who works at MAPS knows what they got because it's a blinded study. And so they come in in the morning, they get their dose around 10 a.m. They're in that comfortable therapeutic setting you saw a picture of a minute ago. And we progress with the treatment. Because it's eight hours and because of the nature of MDMA, there will be periods of talking and engagement, processing trauma or processing something else that's coming up for them. There could be periods of what we call going inside, which is being quiet, uh, maybe reclining on the couch or futon that's provided for them. The therapists in that stance are just holding space so the person can have their experience with the substance or with whatever emotions are coming up without needing to verbalize everything all the time. We use selective use of therapeutic music and optional eye masks, so that facilitates that process also of going inward. Uh, we're a culture that likes to intellectualize and verbalize things, and a lot of what we do happens here. And a lot of trauma is stored here, and there's usually a disconnect. So that period of going inward can be a really helpful time for somebody to actually just sink into their body. And I always like to remind them, you don't have to do anything. So we proceed throughout their session. At an hour and a half in, they get a supplemental dose, which is 50% of the original. If it was placebo, it's placebo. If it was MDMA, say it was 120 milligrams to start, it would be 60 milligrams in the supplemental, which is optional, but pretty much everybody takes it. The supplemental doesn't necessarily intensify the experience, but it prolongs the experience so we can get the full eight hours of therapy. So eight hours go by, people have been talking and going inward and processing and connecting with their body, maybe doing some body work, maybe listening to music, maybe not listening to music. And at the end of the eight hours, we come to some closure in the session. And the participant will stay the night at the study site. And the two therapists will be relieved by a night attendant who will be on site and provide the participant with a meal, supervision, and any kind of support they need. We'll call the therapists if some extra support is needed or some crisis may be happening. And in the morning, the therapists return and they do the first of three integration sessions, which are again 90 minute talk therapy sessions. So sometimes we say that the most of the healing work that happens in MDMA therapy is in the weeks after the session, because the session is so impactful and can be a lot of information, uh, physical information, emotional information, insights, and there's this whole process of consolidating that experience that is actually how it applies to life and how it actually makes changes in somebody's post-traumatic stress. So that part of the process is really important. It's common that people towards the end of their session or the next day can say things like, was that even real? Did everything I was, what I was experiencing, was that authentic? Was that just made up? Or does it have a real impact? Or how am I going to go back to my same old job, and my same old relationship, and my same old habits? And how, like, how is that all going to work when I go back home? How am I going to explain this to my family? So that Overnight stay is really helpful that they don't have to rush into any of those things. I have to be at work, I have to explain this to my family, I have to be present for my kids. You just get to rest. And we really encourage people to take the next day off. Um, after the three integration sessions, then that whole round happens again. An eight hour experimental session and an overnight stay. Three talk therapy sessions until they've had three experimental sessions and the following integration. And then they go into follow-up. So that whole process takes about four months and 65 hours of therapy. It's a time-intensive process. So phase two trials are the trials we've just completed, double-blind, placebo-controlled. Um, I'll just summarize by meaning that's the standard of conducting science for doing drug development. We've tested for treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder. We've also done 
Trials with Social Anxiety in Adults with Autism. That was at UCLA Harbor. Anxiety Associated with Life-Threatening Illness. This was a study I worked on last year in Marin, California. Mostly cancer patients who are dealing with how to live with their diagnosis. And then uh, with a cur currently underway study, Cognitive Behavioral Conjoint Therapy. We really didn't think the FDA was going to go for this. We said, okay, we can treat somebody with PTSD, but we also want to treat one of their friends. Mm -hmm. And it's called Conjoint Therapy. And what we're treating really is the relationship, the person with the PTSD and the significant relationship that's being impacted by a loved one, a family member, a spouse, a sibling friend. Um, and part of it is, it's multifaceted and we're in the midst of it, but to have that person who can support in your life, who has a reference for this experience called MDMA therapy and this healing process and what it can bring up. Um, so it's pretty exciting. That's in Charleston. So post-traumatic stress is our main focus of our MDMA research. We've tested these other populations to see if MDMA therapy could be beneficial to other populations. If the treatment is approved for PTSD, it could potentially be used off-label for other conditions if there's published research that would support a doctor's use in that way. So focusing on post-traumatic stress, we've completed six phase two PTSD trials Different trials have tested dose response, which means we've tested different doses. Is it better to give them 75 milligrams or 100 or 125? We're finding that 75 has been slightly more effective than 125, and 100 has been the worse, so it's not linear. <laughs> so um, we're doing some different doses in phase three to kind of hone that in more. Uh, we're also doing BK studies, which the chemists in the room would know a lot more about than I do, but how MDMA is actually metabolized. And so when you're creating a medication, all those fine print on the medication, like don't mix with alcohol, have on an empty stomach, have with food, may cause nausea, um, you know, should you have a higher dose if you weigh more or not. So all of that's really being fine-tuned right now. And then also the source of the trauma. So we had our first proof of principle study was in 20 participants, uh, survivors of childhood sexual abuse. And then we had a study specifically for veterans, firefighters, and police officers. And we found that the treatment was pretty much equivalently effective for both populations, supporting that we can work with post-traumatic stress of various sources of trauma. Our primary outcome measure is the clinician-administered PTSD scale, CAPS. It's a 30-question interview, and the score tells you how intense some of these PTSD is. So this is a conglomeration of the six studies together uh, and our results. The blue is the placebo group, and we tested their CAPS at stage one before they had any therapy, and then at primary, which was after two therapy sessions. You can see they even got some benefit just from the placebo. You can imagine having two therapists in a comfortable room for eight hours, three times, or two times. Um, that, it, that drop is about equivalent to people who take Zoloft for their post-traumatic stress. And then the red group is the active group. You can see a significant, much more significant drop uh, at a p-value less than 0.001. And then the MDMA group goes on to finish their third session, which is end of stage one. They continue to have improvements. The placebo group gets a chance to come back and have MDMA. We don't just say, sorry, you got sugar pill, bye. Um, they get to come back. We do an open label study, so we know that they're going to get MDMA. They have these three sessions, which is stage two baseline to end of stage two. And we're seeing that the results are durable at the 12 plus month follow up for both populations. Some of the common side effects, so there are, all drugs have risks to them, we're not, you know, we're not saying this is the magic pill. Um, these are things that we talk about in the informed consent before we recruit a participant and things that we prepare them for and monitor during their session. Most of these can, 
not everyone will experience all of these, and most of these are only experienced during the hours that the drug is actively in somebody's system. I'm going to be really brief about this because I want to focus more on, on training, um, but this can be helpful for those of you who aren't as familiar with the research to inform the training piece of this. This is the study I worked on. This is Mount Tam. We had 180 degree views out of our therapy room, um, which is probably a confounding variable in our study results. <laughs> And just to summarize, I'm not going to go into each point here, but our, our, this was our primary outcome, the state trait anxiety inventory. We're measuring anxiety associated with somebody's life-threatening illness diagnosis. And you can see, similar to our PTSD results, just how um, significant the reduction is in anxiety. We're still doing the six-month follow-ups. I'm actually leaving tomorrow, so I can do a 12-month follow-up with a participant, um, which is exciting. And I'm just going to go through that. Great. So training therapy teams. Does anybody have any questions about the really basic structure of the therapy? Like you're really confused about something because I don't want to leave you behind. Okay, great. So the training program has been operating as long as we've been doing research. When I was trained by Mike Lanani in 2014, it was in somebody's living room, it was eight people. We spent a full week together watching therapy videos and talking about all the different aspects of the therapy and asking questions. And so now it's evolved quite a bit. In the last year, we've trained about 125 people. 82 of them actually will be working on phase three next year. And it's been a five module program. We have an online course that takes about 14 hours. It goes through the basic chemical structure of MDMA more in depth about potential mechanisms of action, study design, protocol. And then we have the live training one, which is very similar to the seven days I spent in a living room. We watch a lot and a lot of therapy videos. Um, it used to be seven and a half days. We've now changed it to six and a half days. And I said, six and a half days is a really long time to watch trauma therapy videos for like nine hours a day. And the response I've gotten is, um, well, if they can do this, then we know we can, they can sit through an eight-hour therapy session. <laughs> um, but we are including more experiential work. The workshop elective part C is something that our trainees do on their own time. They submit a proposal for a modality that's um, compatible with our treatment manual. So I mentioned a few earlier internal family systems, holotropic breath work. And so these are modalities that inform the treatment manual that we've created, and they provide skills. So a lot of clinicians are uncomfortable with touching their clients or have never had any training with it, so they don't have competence in how to do that. Um, some people have more experience doing research and less experience doing trauma. Some people are vice versa. So they pick electives that can bulk up areas in their skill set. Um, that could use some more experience. And then the part D is the live training too. This is highly experiential. We actually do a two-day holotropic breathwork workshop together where therapy pairs sit for each other, which if you don't know, holotropic breathwork is using breath to induce a non-ordinary state of consciousness. I was amazed that you can get completely altered by just breathing when I first did it. Um, so that's a, a powerful and legal option for a lot of people. And then we also did role plays, so playing out typical scenarios that can happen, scenarios relating to having a co-therapy pair. A lot of clinicians have never worked with a co-therapist. The very first time I'd ever worked with a co-therapist was my very first therapy session with a study participant. And I got in there and I said, ooh, this is a steep learning curve. Um, to just figure out how to navigate who's going to talk and who's going to do which part and your different theoretical orientations. I do have a question. Does that relate to the constellation work when you're talking about the role playing? Um, I'm not familiar with how, I'm not really familiar with that, no. Okay. No, I don't think so. It sounds like so. Yeah. The role play is playing out like a mock therapy session where we give them a scenario so 
um, okay, you're a therapist pair, pretend that your study participant has something challenging coming up and they say this, what would you do? Yeah. So scenario thing. Yeah. And then the final part of the training is supervision. So this is a piece that we have never done before, but we knew that we wanted to make sure that the 82 people who were going to work on phase three were really competent. And up until this point, we'd only trained eight or ten people at a time. And so we're kind of, I think the training committee is a little bit like nervous parents having their child uh, flee the coop uh, and wanting to make sure that they have all the support they need. And supervision is an important part of clinical work. So the study that is imminently happening is called MP16. There's a lot of acronyms in clinical research. It's actually an open label phase two trial. And suffice it to say, it's a very small, short trial where each therapy pair treats one participant who has PTSD and it's open label. And the therapy pair gets a lot of support and supervision around that. And they're supervised by our lead therapist, Michael and Annie, and also Marcella Ochelaro. All of our therapy sessions, in fact, pretty much all of our study sessions are video and audio taped and they're reviewed for adherence to the protocols. So when you have so many people, it's not just making sure the MDMA is pure and potent and people are using the right dose, but it's also the therapy component. How do you know that people are conducting a similar kind of a therapy? So if people are conducting wildly different therapies, you don't have as good of results saying, you know, this particular treatment modality works. So we have some lovely adherence raters in the room. If you're an adherence rater or you're in training, would you raise your hand? Hey! Yes. And so these folks are undergoing uh, an in-depth training program so that they're watching the therapy videos and they're looking for competencies in the therapist, how they're adhering to the treatment manual, and are they doing some of the particular steps that need to happen, like checking for suicidal safety at certain points or asking about what they, the participant understands about post-traumatic stress and about their trauma. So they're very crucial for our supervision. Our adherence readers watch hundreds and hundreds of hours of video. It's a very resource dense project, but we believe that we want to make sure that all of our therapy pairs are offering really quality and consistent therapy to our participants, so that's why we do it. This is one of our therapy cohorts. In the last two years, we've had trainings in Hermosa Beach. This is Estes Park, Colorado, um, also at Stony Point, New York, and there will be many, many more after this. So MT1 is a therapist study. It's an FDA-approved clinical trial. So we've gotten all this interest in people who want to become therapists, but not everybody has experience with psychedelics or with MDMA, or definitely not a lot of people have experience receiving MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And so it's kind of difficult to relate to somebody in a psychedelic state if you don't have any kind of reference for that. So we actually got the FDA approved this study where we can give the protocol to our researchers who are training to become MDMA therapists. So they come in and they get one placebo and one MDMA session. They get to experience what both of them are like. It's a really powerful experience. Most people go for it. We can't require that all of our therapists take MDMA in this study, but we strongly suggest it, especially to the people who are psychedelically naive. I talked a little bit about the supervision study, but on the next slide I can show you these are our sites. And um, these sites will, are participating in the supervision study, which will roll out into phase three, that larger study that happens next year. We have a site in North Hollywood. It's our closest one. We really bought for a San Diego site, and there may be an opportunity for that in the next couple of years. We will also roll out a phase three study in Europe in about a year or two after the one in the U.S. and Canada gets started. And what's not on the map is we have two sites in Israel in the works. I'm just
just going to skip this. It's a little too... I, want, I really want to focus on training. So phase three is the largest trial that MAPS has ever conducted. It's the largest trial testing the ther potential therapeutic use of the MDMA therapy. It will start in the spring. We have to use a really high quality drug that costs a lot of money, but we've secured it. And it's going to happen in two parts. In total, we'll treat up to 300 participants. And this phase of research is to test for efficacy, to see, okay, we had great results in phase two. We had CAPS score drops of 68%. So that PTSD score, they actually dropped 68% when you combine all of our studies. And we'll treat a larger population. And after phase three, this is Marcella receiving her study drug. The drug is highly, highly regulated, and we have to have a locked safe with an alarm and a unique security code for each person in a locked room with an alarm and a key that only site staff can have in a building that can't be accessed by the public. <laughs> One time, uh, the DEA came to check one of our sites, and they said, well, there's a window in this room up here, and we're, we're not sure if somebody could climb through. And they said, no, you know, there's a ledge on the other side. Nobody can even walk up to the building. They said, well, could a car drive through the building and crash the wall, and then people could steal the MDMA? Mm -hmm. But uh, we hadn't thought about that. <laughs> um, the amount of MDMA that would be at one site is probably less than the amount that's in a lot of people's homes. <laughs> so expanded access, this is where it starts to get interesting about possibilities in this room and in San Diego. Expanded access is an FDA program. It's something that a research organization would apply for as phase three is well underway. It basically means there's urgent need for this treatment and there's greater demand than our phase three trial can meet. So because our phase three trials spread out across about 15 sites, each site is really only gonna treat about 18, 20 participants. And that's about the same size as our phase two studies. Each of our phase two studies was right around that. In our phase two study in Charleston treated 24 people and they have a wait list of 700. So that's pretty unheard of in clinical research. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, well, how do you do your recruitment? I was like, recruitment? <laughs> I mean, all you have to do is say, MDMA therapy, and show the, the results, and people are like, lining up. Um, it's wild, it's great. It's, it's sad in a way, because people are so desperate for treatment. And it feels, you know, being a researcher, it feels like this is imminent and this is about to happen and we're only you know, a couple years away from potentially the FDA making this approved medicine. But for people who struggle to get through a day because of post-traumatic stress, saying, oh, it's, it's close, it's four years away, that's a really long time. So we practice a lot of finesse and expanded access is a really hopeful program and we have already gotten some successes with the FDA this summer, breakthrough therapy designation and special protocol assignment are basically programs that say, we will help you work through your paperwork faster. Because the FDA knows that the paperwork is ridiculous, so they actually have a special program that you can apply for that they will expedite the process of filling out the paperwork so that you can start your research sooner. Um, so we're doing that and They've also reviewed our phase three protocol and given us feedback so that we can set ourselves up for success to have expanded access be likely to be approved. So it's really exciting. So expanded access, we're hoping to have 50 to 100 more sites. In the next three years, we want to train 300 more people so that when MDMA therapy gets legalized, there are already providers who are trained and ready to go. We don't have to delay further when people can get treatment. Expanded access would operate as a cost recovery program. So it's somewhere between research and private practice where patients would actually pay for the treatment, the cost of the treatment. Whereas in our clinical research, we never charge people to, to come and participate in the research. Expanded access would be 
the applicants that we'd be looking for would really be full sites that would come to us. So whereas when we were accepting applicants for therapists for phase three, we were screening each applicant, looking at resumes, figuring out who paired well together, how many pairs were gonna be at a site, how to help them find a building, because we're the sponsor of the research. Expanded access is gonna be a little bit different. It's gonna be as if you were going to school to become you know, a doctor or an accountant. Uh, they don't put you together with who your business team will be in the future. They don't provide you with what your facility, your office will be and, and how you'll do marketing. We provide you the training so that you can do that. So that's in essence what the training program will be like in the future. And so that means that people who are interested in becoming expanded access sites should be working now to be identifying other clinicians that would be compatible with this work, that would be compatible in a co-therapy pair, to start identifying who could the team be, who could be an MD, who can prescribe the MDMA, because MDMA is a drug, so it has to be prescribed by an MD or somebody qualified to write prescriptions. Since MDMA is a Schedule One DEA drug, they have to have a special DEA license. They go through a thorough background check with the DEA and have a plan for drug storage and administration of it. We've actually had a success with the DEA in our plans for the supervision study, which is starting, which is they will actually allow us to have authorized administrators of the drug that can work underneath the doctor, so the doctor doesn't have to actually be there which is really helpful because the therapy pair, the two therapists would come to do their session and the doctor would have to walk in the room and give the participant the drug and walk out and wait for an hour and a half or come back in about an hour and a half and see if they wanted the supplemental dose, which even five minutes of a doctor's time is pretty expensive. So it, allowing therapists to administer it is really helpful. So I talked about the therapy training program, which the structure of it will be updated for expanded access, making it more accessible because it's difficult to take that much time off of work. We had a full week live training. We repeated it twice. So we're trying to figure out, is there a way that we can just have one week in person and do more training online, maybe watching videos or having more supervision? We're also planning to have trainings in many different regions so that people in lots of different places can get trainings. You saw where our phase three sites are. We want to have a site here in San Diego. We want to have sites that have been underserved, like more sites in the deep south, more sites in the Midwest, some sites in the Pacific Northwest. So having a lot of trainings all over the place. I want to keep talking about expanded access um, uh, the training program at least. So I want to talk about timelines. So phase three is planned to start in spring next year and we can't apply for expanded access until phase three is well underway. So MAPS will apply for expanded access in approximately this time next year, mid-fall. The whole application process for expanded access will probably take about six months with that DA. So it probably won't get approved until early 2019. Now Rick Doblin, founder of MAPS and one of my bosses, continues to say, well we have to wait until we have approval, but then he gets really excited. He says, no, there's so many good therapists, we have to train them right away. So we're ready to start the training program anywhere between 10 and 20 months from now. And Early next year, my plan is to launch an application process so that people can actually submit their team's application. I'm a therapist, I want to work with this therapist, this is our team, this is our ND, this would be our potential facility. And we would review those site applications to see would this team be potentially qualified to be an expanded access site? Do they have experience in treating trauma? Have they been in practice for some time? Have they ever worked together? Have they ever worked on clinical research or programs similar to this? So kind of what is their track record? That's what we're looking for. 
We really love seeing that people have experience in some kind of body work, as I've mentioned, holotropic breath work, somatic experiencing, because that is part of our treatment manual, and it's not required that our therapists have to conduct body work, but a lot of times that will come up for a participant in their experience, and they might ask for some kind of helpful, you know, could you please hold my hand, or could I have help working with this pressure that's building in my chest, and then having some competence with how to work with that. Yeah. Yeah. Mindfulness-based practices, yeah, definitely. I'm just thinking of Mary Casamano, who's a researcher at the Hefter Research Institute. She worked on some of the psilocybin mushroom studies. So there's a parallel organization called Hefter on the East Coast, and they're doing, they're kind of, we have this friendly race with them who can legalize psychedelic medicine first. Yeah. yeah. And they're treating um, major depressive disorder with psilocybin. We, they've also done, they're currently doing a study with um, long-term meditators and, and psilocybin. So she came to our training program, and she brought a lot of, of the mindfulness practices to our our trainees. So our trainees, we've trained now, you know, 125 people in the last two years, and they come from all kinds of different backgrounds. If you've been at one of our trainings before, raise your hand. It might just be you, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so Eric is a somatic experiencing counselor, um, and a lot of people come in with master's degrees in, in mental health professions, doctorate degrees, psychiatrists, MDs, sometimes we get internal medicine doctors who are like, wait, I chose the wrong specialty. Um, so let me, let me take a little poll. How many are doctors in this room? Okay. How many are doctorate level mental health people? Yeah. How many are master's level mental health people? How many have a bachelor's in psychology or some mental health related? How many in hard sciences? Yeah. How many in cultural, cultural anthropology, sociology? Yeah. How many in art? Yeah. What, what else did I miss? Body workers. Body workers? Yeah. Did anybody not get a chance to raise their hand? I'm a certified clinical hypnotherapist. Okay, great. Great. Thanks for representing that. A veteran. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. So we try to make room for all kinds of different experiences that people can bring because we have the two people in the therapy pair and we require that one of them be a licensed mental health professional, as I said and the other person can work under the supervision of them. And so that could be all kinds of different things. We know that there are people who are really excellent at this modality who aren't necessarily licensed professionals. We also know there's a lot of licensed professionals who may not be very good at this modality. Um, so, so that's really what we're looking for. The training for expanded access, because it's a cost recovery program and operates like of private practice will involve tuition, which is also something we've never charged people for because so far we've only ever trained researchers who are working on our studies. So now we're training people who are starting their own practices and businesses. So rolling out in the next few months, we'll be starting to deliver what our tuition structure is like, scholarship programs, our timelines, our application. I'm currently working on a document of just what are all of the qualifications for a site. So I mentioned some qualifications around DEA security. So if you have a site, we can talk about facilities for a couple of minutes. If you have a facility that you're thinking about, things to consider are the zoning laws in your county. And you might not necessarily want to call up your county and say, I'm thinking about doing a DMA therapy, is that okay with you? But you could say something like, I'm thinking about having a therapeutic practice or possibly even having a medical doctor come and do site visits here. Are there any regulations in, uh, on this building about having therapeutic or medical visits? 
Are there any limitations on the hours of them? So that's really good information to collect. If people are renting office space, they need to check in with their landlord about that. So that's the facility. And then as far as, yeah. Um, so would, would this, would the clients sleep over? Because uh, that would change this whole site completely. So what do you, would you think about a site where, where it could be all kind of, you could just be there and they could go upstairs. Um, and there was complete, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so the question is, would the overnight stay still be required for expanded access? And the answer is probably not required. Yeah. So we're starting to think about accessibility. For our clinical research, we've had the highest standard of care. Two therapists, eight hour sessions, overnight stays, night attendants, heart monitors, temperature gauges, and the DEA has been the same. At first we had to have this safe that cost us $4,000, and now it could be a walking medicine cabinet. So as we're showing that this treatment is, is relatively safe, we're getting um, less restrictions on, on how we have to conduct it. There will be some things that will absolutely have to be adhered on going forward. They're just part of the modality, such as staying with somebody for the duration of, of their therapy session, which is six to eight hours, and the purity of the drug, and there will be regulations on the doses and who is qualified to provide this treatment. So MDMA is off patent. It was created in 1912 by Merck in Germany, a pharmaceutical company. Um, nobody really knew anything about it or knew of its psychoactive effects until the 70s. And it became popular in the Bay Area. A group of psychologists were testing it on themselves and then realized that it was safe and it was actually really beneficial. And so psychologists were using it in couples therapy. And, um, that's partly where the male-female co-therapy model came, as a lot of those psychologists were working in male-female co-therapy pairs with couples, two people who would come in for the treatment. There's so much to say about the training program, and there's so many unknowns still. Because it's all dependent on what our next meeting with the FDA results. So our next meeting with the FDA is December 18th. And anytime we have a meeting with the FDA, many of our staff go to fly to DC, sometimes for a one hour meeting. And in that meeting, we will find out a lot about phase three and about what expanded access is going to be looking like. So I want to give time for questions. And so maybe we can go to the last slide. After expanded access, we will submit a new drug application, and we hope that MDMA-assisted psychotherapy will become a legal prescription medicine in 2021. And that would mean a future network of psychedelic clinics. So we're already starting with 15 for phase three, maybe 100 for expanded access, and maybe thousands at post-approval. And I just want to say thank you to my mentors, and Michael Lanny and Marcella, I mentioned them. Rick Dalman founded MAPS. Amy Emerson leads the MPBC Corporation. And many of my colleagues and my husband, Dan, for being a clicker. <laughs> so I'd be happy to take questions. I want to take the general lights up a little bit. Well, I was just on a webinar today where the VA and DOD and National Center of PTSD rolled out their new guideline, clinical practice guidelines. They just published a new one this year for treating post-traumatic stress. And there was no mention of MDMA, which I wasn't really surprised about. Um, but they were, they were pretty down on cannabis and ketamine, uh, even though we are doing a double-blind placebo-controlled control study using cannabis for 
symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Um, so it's a really slow process. At individual VAs, it's been pretty well accepted. Like I presented Grand Browns at the Sepulveda VA last week. Well received, lots of great questions. We were really close to having a study site in Palo Alto, at one of the VA centers there. But so far it's really slow. They have provided us with resources and insight. Our two therapists who are working with Michael and Annie on the conjoint therapy study in Charleston are actually VA therapists from Toronto who fly down, the VA flies them down to work on her study. So that's pretty cool. Um, but we keep saying, we'll, we'll pay for it if you just let us do it at your sites. And, and so I think it's just a matter of changing some of that taboo in the PR around psychedelics. Um, how many military in the room? I know we heard one. Active or, or former? A couple. Okay, thanks for being here. So, what's always fascinating is how MAP somehow got a Schedule 1 into a research trial, and was that partly because it was a drug that, that a manufacturing company had made in the 1900s, versus, because it's like saying, because in the eyes of the DEA, Schedule 1 is like saying, hey, I want to I study heroin, and they're going to, they map, it's basically LSD, psilocybin, heroin, and now actually Kraton was about to be entered into Schedule 1. It's like, to them to give up a Schedule 1 for research almost seems impossible. Mm -hmm. So how did MAPS get, get around actually getting it and then have it manufacturing in the U.S.? I mean, I know how the marijuana industry got around that, but it took them 30 plus years to pull it off and even get to where we're at now. Yeah. The, the government grew weed, growing weed we get for our studies is pretty terrible too. <laughs> the MDMA we've used in the phase two trials was actually made 32 years ago. It was a 500 gallon drum um, that the DEA actually stores for us now. And it doesn't go bad, so that's good. And it was manufactured before MDMA became schedule one. So that group of psychologists was using it before it became Schedule 1. And my boss, Rick Doblin, found out about this group of people and about the potentially beneficial effects of MDMA in about, I don't know, the early 80s. And he knew it was only a matter of time that the DEA was going to get a hold of it and schedule it and probably schedule it into one. So he mailed MDMA to a bunch of people, to rabbis and psychologists and politicians, and he said, take this now before it's illegal, and that way when the DEA has their court case to decide which schedule it should be scheduled in, we can have legal testimony from professionals about the therapeutic uses, or at least about a case why we should schedule it in Schedule 2 and make research easier. The court judge who actually ruled over all of those testimonies recommended that MDMA be made a Schedule II drug, but that was overruled by the DEA, who is the ultimate authority. And so MDMA was made Schedule I in 85, and MAPS was founded the year after that. So the goal is to get into Schedule II, and you know specifically, is it Schedule II narcotic, or just Schedule II? Because that ultimately would affect like mid-level providers and because some could do two, but not narcotic two. I don't know the difference of, between two and narcotic two. We would love for it to be three, but, but it will probably be two. But I don't know the difference about narcotic. Yeah. Will the expanded access sites still be kind of investigational in that there will be data collected from the universe of different? Yeah. There will be safety data collected from expanded access sites, but not outcome data, which means we will collect any adverse events that happen, like this person took MDMA and then had a headache. We have to record that, that's safety data. Um, but they won't be testing um, outcome, like how much did their CAP score drop, at least not for the purpose of, of our publication. Any information on pricing for the expanded access? It's a really good question. Um, yeah, I'll have to look up the exact number, but you can imagine that two therapists for 65 hours of therapy 
over the course of a few months gets up there. And the worry is, somebody asked me, is this going to be like ketamine treatment? And it's going to be a couple of thousand bucks a pop, and who can afford to do that? And the difference is ketamine is being used off-label for depression. And so that's one difference about having insurance cover it. But if it were out of pocket, it would be somewhere in the range of a few thousand dollars per um, treatment. Um, we are working with an insurance representative now to try to establish a new billing code, which is kind of like, I don't know, adding an 11th commandment. <laughs> um, so we're making that, we're, we're developing a case for that so that insurance could actually cover this treatment, but it would have to be a new billing code because it's eight hours, two therapists, has to have a special training. And there's a lot that goes into that, like potentially creating an entire licensing board similar to the Board of Behavioral Sciences or the American Psychological Association, an entire new board that would certify psychedelic therapists. Um, so we're, we're working on it. Are, are there any conversations happening around having one therapist instead of two? Yeah, our standard is two, and for expanded access, it's really likely that we will require two for the safety and the rollout. However, post-approval, it might be that the way that the FDA approves it would allow for one therapist. Sorry. <laughs> You've been enlightened. <laughs> There's a question in the back. Yeah, so do the phase two trials normally at the safety side, you're using a standard dosage rather than phase three manipulating that quantity. Uh, can you share how many milligrams that everybody was getting? In phase two? Yeah. Depending on which studies, we had six studies. The We had one where they were getting 125. We had one where we compared 75, 100, and 125. So the lowest has been 75, the highest has been 125. We've done active and inactive placebo, and our active placebos have been either 30 or 40 milligrams. Do they show a difference between the inactive placebo? Our, so we had to start out with inactive placebo, so we had a baseline comparison, just the therapy compared to MDMA plus therapy. And then we moved into active to try to have more efficacy with the blind, and it was Pretty, it worked pretty well for blinding the therapists and the participant. However, people, participants were experiencing a major increase in their negative PTSD symptoms, more anxiety, more insomnia, more flashbacks. Microdosing doesn't work, got it. <laughs> I know of people who microdose on MDMA and I don't get it, so I'm not sure, but it didn't work in our studies. And, and so for this, the sake of the well-being and safety of the participants, we forewent the active placebo. It's really difficult to have an effective placebo with psychedelic yeah. substances. You kind of know after a couple of hours if they're going to do it. Give us the side, the side effect profile when dealing with the pure, because uh, in, the, in, the, in the party or festival scene or street scene, um, there's no such thing as pure. And so a lot of times it's most, you, you could be getting MDXX, is really what we're calling it. Because there's bath salts, could be MDA, it's just like you never know unless you're actually like testing through dancing, at least getting the farm of being in the MD world. Um, and so a lot of times you have this post experience of crash or depression. And I'm curious with the cure in the study, were people having any long term depressive effects uh, like you would with a street product? Mm -hmm. We mention it in our informed consent that it's a possibility that people can have a depressed mood for you know, a day or a couple of days after the MDMA session. We don't, there, there haven't been any studies about what that is specifically. There's a lot of theories that it's serotonin depletion, um, but there are also some theories about having done trauma work for eight hours can sometimes cause a dip, but we know that people in the recreational settings you know, are, are commonly reporting that dip. So it's just something we educate people with before they even sign up for the study. And then in our phase two trials, we had not only those three integration sessions, but every day one of the therapists would call the participant for seven days following the therapy session. And sometimes that was like a three minute phone call. Hey, how's it going today? I'm doing great, I'm busy, I'm doing really fine, I'll talk to you tomorrow. 
but sometimes it was a bit longer. So things can come up, or people can have that depressed mood. So we don't know yet. And we can't give things in our study, like some people recreationally use 5-HTP or different supplements to mitigate those effects. And uh, as far as I know, there haven't been trials to, to specify what the efficacy of that is. And also, it would be a, a introducing a new variable in our studies. Yeah, I was curious. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I was curious, uh, with open access, um, are they going to be allowed to do off-label treatments? Expanded access will be, it's an improved protocol, so it's still an FDA investigational protocol. Mm -hmm. So it can only be MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress. However, post-approval, once the medicine's made into a legal prescription medicine, then our understanding is it will be like other treatments where it's up to the doctor's discretion to administer it off-label for conditions other than post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. And then I know that it's pretty stringent in uh, the phase three trials as far as how treatment resistant someone has to be. Um, would that also apply to the um, expanded access? So our phase two trials were treatment resistant on chronic PTSD. We actually don't have that condition anymore. So in order to qualify as severe, to, or in order to qualify as PTSD, somebody has to have their symptoms for six months um, or longer. So. The six month period is kind of like a natural distress reaction if you had some major life event happen, but if it's going beyond six months, it's a post traumatic stress diagnosis. And our phase three trial is severe, meaning they have over a particular score on the CAP scale, but that won't necessarily be true post approval. It could be a frontline treatment, meaning anybody who has PTSD for six months could potentially qualify if they, if they don't have any of the exclusion criteria. Um, so, has there been any studies proven to do clinical research regarding um, MDA, aka Zephyrus, and has there been any relation similar to that? Yeah, so people have asked us about that, and not that I know of, no, okay. there hasn't. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> Contraindications for applicants in phase three? Yeah. Um, it's interesting because we're a really transparent organization, but I actually can't be as transparent with the exclusion criteria because um, sometimes, occasionally, rarely, what we've discovered is people find out what would exclude them, and then when they go to apply for screening, they just they manipulate to. It doesn't happen a lot, but I mean, there aren't very many effective treatments for post-traumatic stress, so to have an opportunity to have a treatment that might be successful is like a silver lining. So I totally understand why somebody would do that. But some of them include medical conditions, like I mentioned hypertension. We used to have an upper age limit, we don't anymore. It's if a doctor believes that somebody is medically fit um, to, to undergo the treatment, like they're, they have enough vitality that they could have a little bit of heart distress during the period of being on MDMA. We do currently only treat people who are over 18, although the FDA will require us to do studies in minors as phase four trials after MDMA therapy is made legal. Uh, we're like, he wants to give MDMA to kids. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give some advice for those of us who want to be part of this effort or some kind of therapists in the future? I know you already did give some any kind of words of yeah, yeah. It's really interesting with this work because it's a hurry up and wait game. But the earlier that people plan, the more likely they are to be considered as a site and to be successful as a site. So now is a great time for clinicians in their regions to get together and to talk about what, why they're interested in this work. Maybe do some informal trainings together, like read the treatment manual together, or do some holotropic breathwork sessions together. So starting some preliminary team development. And when people are at about that point, they've identified a potential group of people they'd like to work with, and they've familiarized themselves with the protocol. That's a really great time for that group of people to start being in closer touch with 
me and with MPBC and just kind of being on the radar. The application process that will launch early next year will formalize that process, of course. Um, so there's that piece. And connecting with current researchers to just kind of be on their radar. So, so I'll be working on this site in North Hollywood, which will be led by Dr. Cole Marta. So connecting with people who are already doing this work, they have very limited time, but if there are any social events or professional events to just kind of get to understand what have been some of their challenges and successes in this process of setting up a site and developing a therapeutic team. Yeah. One here and one there, and then I three more questions. Yeah. Well, along those lines, would volunteering with Zendo be kind of along that? And that's just volunteer, there's training. Definitely. You're, you're helping plug Zendo. Yeah. <laughs> so the Zendo project is psychedelic harm reduction. We go to music festivals, we set up a safe space, we do peer-to-peer -peer counseling with people who are having difficult psychedelic experiences. Um, I would absolutely love to do more Zendo training in, the, in Southern California. We just did San Diego's regional burn at Utopia, and that was actually our last event of the year. But go to zendoproject.org, you can fill out a volunteer application profile. That is great experience. It's rare experience that you can actually sit with people who are actually on psychedelics. And it is so rewarding and completely spontaneous. <laughs> One more question in the back. At this point, we're looking for people who can offer the whole package. Yeah, um, people will always need to have a prescribing MD. So for us, the only way we, we have to manage our training resources. So we only want to train people who are actually going to be able to do this work um, in a in an ethical and legal way, because there's so much need for it. So there's a lot of training that could happen for like personal benefit and development, but. People who come in with an MD and have shown we have all of the things in place to actually be able to perform this modality according to the FDA's regulations, those are going to be the people that we prioritize training. But post-approval, I mean, it could be that more people can come in on an individual basis and then after training they can start to organize, okay, who are other people who have been through the training program and where do I want to position myself? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. I'm, I'm here to go. Yes. So um, I do want to make one other little um, plug. And this research is really expensive. And we aren't like other pharmaceutical companies. It's completely, the MDMA research is completely privately funded. It's all for 31 years, millions and millions of dollars, people who just care really deeply about this work. So I encourage you to consider, these will be out, these are pledge cards. If there's any gift that you can give, uh, one of our board members and major donors is, doc, is David Bronner, Dr. Bronner Soaps, which is just 30 miles north of here. And he has just, he's given a lot to MAPS over the years. And he's just pledged $5 million towards our phase three trial. Um, but phase three is going to cost $25 million. So we're, we're up to $18 million. And uh, whether it's five or 15 or 50 or $5 million, um, <laughs> these pledge cards will, will take that. And these will be over here with pens uh, and envelope for privacy. If you want, you can hand them. To me or Caitlin will collect them. Um, donations are, are tax deductible, so I know people are trying to think about taxes. <laughs> Thank you.